A reading from Acts. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard of there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into what then were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John's baptism baptized by repentance, telling the people to believe the one who has come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. The Word of the Lord. A gospel read. And now we'll have a gospel reading from one, uh, chapter 1 of Mark. John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and from the people of Jerusalem came out to join him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and, baptized by, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my son. The beloved, with you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you, my friends in Christ. Organizational psychologist Adam Grant wrote a book called Think Again. Now, it's not about church or theology or even Jesus. But as I'm reading it, I can't help but apply many of his principles and think about, man, how would this work in the church? How could the church benefit from just thinking and rethinking things? It's not about throwing away tradition. It's not even about coming up with the latest fad and trying to come up with a new marketing scheme. In fact, one of my favorite lines in his book is that he says, the purpose of learning isn't to affirm our beliefs. It's to evolve our beliefs. What would happen if our learning about God evolved our beliefs? Last weekend, I was at a drill, and one of the sergeants comes up to me, and he asked me a question. He goes, you know, chaplain, are you worried that as they start doing these interviews and people start saying more things about extraterrestrials and UFOs, that that might cause like a crisis of faith for people? I was like, I don't know what he's getting at, but I don't think this is one of those gotcha kind of questions. And so I said, I don't think so. I said, you know, maybe it will for some people. Some people will deny things even if there's concrete proof. But I said, look, I think people are going to be able to see that this could expand our understanding of God's infinite universe and God's world. And it's going to be beyond anything that we can imagine. And why would we limit God? And he looks at me and he says, yeah, I think so too. All right. I think he was more curious about how I was going to use some methods to answer his question. So Grant in his book talks about the three different modes that we enter when it comes to our conversations with talking with other people. How our minds begin to process how we're going to respond when the other person's talking. And now you're, you're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, 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 that's so if, if you could have this conversation, how would you respond? One of these modes, you're going to be like, that's Pastor John. 
It's the first one. It's preacher mode. But we all go into preacher mode. It's preacher mode when we start talking about our sacred beliefs. I know, right? I got to put Bishop Michael Curry up there, right? Okay. It's when we talk about how our sacred beliefs are in jeopardy. And so we deliver sermons. And now this is like metaphorical sermons. When we're talking to someone and we're trying to protect and promote our ideals. We also might go into prosecutor mode when we recognize the flaws in someone else's reasoning. We marshal arguments to prove them wrong and to win our case. Like you've probably had those conversations or you may be that person or you've talked to people who are like, you're never going to be able to get a word in because they're only telling you how wrong you are. And people don't need to raise your hands on that, okay? Um, or, or you shift into politician mode. I had to think of somebody who wouldn't like get everybody worked up. So I picked Zelensky. <clears throat> okay, so when you go into politician mode, uh, we're trying to win over our audience. And so I was like, yeah, Zelensky, when he was like talking to Congress, okay? So we campaign and we lobby, lobby for the approval of our constituents. We're trying to be able to persuade and win our case. You know, the, the risk is that we become so wrapped up in preaching that we're right or prosecuting others who are wrong or we're politicking for support that we don't bother to rethink our own views. So what's Adam Grant's alternative to this? He suggests thinking scientifically to make decisions with a critical lens. And when our hypotheses are not, that's a really hard word to say, right? Hypotheses are not supported. Then it's time to rethink the way that we're doing things. And if you don't think that this has ever happened in church, let me tell you a story from the Bible. It's one of the characters in our readings today. So, okay, all right, we had the Acts reading, right? So that was, that was in there. And then we had the Matthew read, or we had the, the John the Baptist reading. So you have big characters, like some defining characters in the Bible. But I'm not talking about John the Baptist. I'm not talking about Paul. Now, Paul's, Paul's got a pretty big role. I'm not even talking about Jesus today. I'm talking about one of the very important characters in today's reading, Apollos. Right? Who's Apollos? Like, well, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. Is he actually in the reading? Barely. While Apollos was in Corinth. He's not even physically there, folks, okay? But Apollos is in Corinth, and Paul comes to Ephesus, and he finds some disciples. Where's Apollos? He's in Corinth. He's not even there. But Apollos, as those Christians who are uh, that Paul is meeting, uh, he's talking to Christians who've been learning from Apollos. They've been learning about Jesus from this guy. And what happens when Paul encounters these disciples? He immediately notices that they are, they are missing some things, that they aren't practicing their faith with the full amount of information that they need to fully understand who Jesus is. In fact, Apollos has been baptizing new converts with John's baptism. What's John's baptism, you might ask? Well, near as we can tell, it's a baptism or a ritual of repentance, being made clean before God. And you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, Paul would tell these disciples that they haven't been baptized by the Holy Spirit. So the information that they had was clearly not fully developed. How is a Holy Spirit baptism different than a baptism by John? Well, compared to John's baptism, we could conclude that a baptism with the Holy Spirit washes over them with the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. That they haven't just been made clean, but now through the death and resurrection of Christ, they have received eternal life. They have salvation. This is a little bit different than John's baptism, isn't it? All of a sudden, Paul knows that he needs to straighten things out in Ephesus. And you might be wondering, well, how does he know that? Well, two of Paul's followers, a couple of women named Priscilla and Aquila, have heard Apollos preaching. We got to scoot back a couple verses. We got to go back to Acts 18. Apollos is a missionary. He lives in Alexandria. See, all the way down there in Egypt. So Apollos has gone on a journey up to Ephesus. It's kind of like his missionary journey. He's like, he's gone here and he's telling everybody about Jesus. He's been baptized in a John in one of John's baptisms. But he's telling them all of these things. And as these two women are hearing him, here's how this text plays out. 
He was instructed in the way. And now you're, you're thinking, what is the way? Well, this is the way that the earliest disciples called themselves. This was before the term Christians came along. So they were known as the way. Uh, like in John 14, the way, the truth, and the life. This was what they were called. So Apollos has all of this enthusiasm. He teaches everybody about Jesus. He speaks boldly in the synagogue. And that's when the two women hear him and they realize that he's missing this detail about Jesus. They realize he doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they, t- they pull him aside and they talk to him. Now, what does Apollos do when they pull him aside? Does he go into preacher mode and start to protect what he, know- what he knows? Like, don't you dare try to correct me. Or does he go into prosecutor mode? Well, you can't be right. I mean, we don't let women speak in the synagogue, so why should I listen to you? Or does he go into politician mode, agreeing with them to their face and thanking them for showing him what he doesn't know, but then return to preaching what he does know and disregarding this new information? No. Apollos listens. And then he asks for further training. He says, send me over to Greece where there's another group of disciples gathered so that they can teach me more so I can more fully live into this thing that is transformational in my life. And that's where Paul enters the story. He comes over to fill this gap. He comes over to help and talks about how important this is. You know, visions for change are more compelling when they include visions of continuity. Although our strategy might evolve, our identity will endure. Paul slips in and doesn't change everything. He tells them how this continuity is going to take place. He fills this gap and tells them how it is to live as a baptized child of God. I don't know about you, but I don't read the Bible the same way that I did when I was a kid who would come up for children's message. I know that my theology from when I was confirmed, it's changed a little bit. Since I was in my 20s, I feel like I've had experiences in my life where I have seen the Holy Spirit and I know how God works and I've been able to continually evolve. I've had this continuity of faith, but I've been able to see how this enduring way of seeing my identity as a child of God has been able to change. Nothing about my faith has stayed static and the same. I'm continuing to learn and to grow. And I'm thrilled when I do discover something that helps me evolve my beliefs. I think that learning more about God has only deepened my love and trust in God, not this thing to be afraid of. As we talked about with the kids this morning, and they probably wish that they would have brought umbrellas. But when we are talking about belonging, thinking about how we belong, it's not about being indoctrinated or being told, well, this is the right way. It's about being part of a community that's going to walk alongside us through some of life's weird challenges and uh, quirky outcomes. And so as we live into this, there is continuity. This way evolved into Christianity and their identity as as children of God was founded firmly in the grace and love of Christ. That, friends, was the lasting legacy. For Apollos, the community of believers didn't throw everything away when they learned about the baptism of Jesus. Instead, they grew stronger. They embraced this new teaching. So here we are. We are the church in 2024. And yet we continue to evolve. We continue to support those who seek belonging. Our identity as the church will endure. Why? Because we believe and we trust that the Holy Spirit is fully present in our lives and in the life of this church. Could this attitude of rethinking change your life? I sure hope so. It could also help each of us to be able to intentionally listen to one another, to be open to learning new things about each other, especially from people who have different backgrounds or different viewpoints than ourselves. We might even learn about having confident humility, getting beyond the things that we don't know so that we can grow and evolve. But I'm getting ahead of myself. More on that next week. I'll probably go into preacher mode again. Sorry. But we'll talk about the transformational presence of Christ that continues to inspire us 
and others to follow Jesus and to know that that lasting legacy will endure. Amen.